There is a hidden history that's been deliberately obfuscated from the peoples of the world, and that's why I am on the trail of the Nephilim. The Genesis 6 narrative states that the Nephilim are on the earth in those days and also afterwards. If that's true, can we find evidence that corroborates this? I'm L.A. Marzulli. Join me as we go on the trail of the Nephilim. Today we're going to be talking about a subject which um, I've, we've actually created a film on it. It's in Watchers 10. It's on the Kandahar Giant, and I think you'll find that interesting. But first, a word from our trusted sponsor. Folks, if you're trying to navigate market turbulence, why not set course to the Noble Gold Investments safe haven? With global uncertainty looming, your savings and retirement plans are under siege. But there's one asset that stood the test of time, and that, my friends, is gold. Unlock the peace of mind that comes with owning gold, the ultimate safe haven. And if precious metals are new to you, Noble Gold Investments will hold your hand through the whole process. They have a team of experts who will guide you every step of the way to safety. Thousands of investors have sheltered their retirement savings with Noble Gold Investments. Don't leave yourself exposed to the markets right now. It's way too risky. With gold at an all-time high and looking to climb even further, it's the perfect time to invest. Open a Noble Gold Investments IRA and secure your future with a free gold bullion coin. Act now before it's too late. 877-646-5347, 877-646-5347, or visit noblegoldinvestments.com. That's noblegoldinvestments.com, noblegoldinvestments.com. So I'm here with Ray. Ray, thank you so much for for coming on the record and, and joining us. And I want to thank Terry Carter for kind of hooking us up. Um, someone sent me the the interview that you did with Terry, and I reached out to Terry. I, I've met Terry years ago, and uh, Terry mm -hmm. sort of, um, you know, was kind enough to give me your contact info, and here you are, and, and thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, not a problem, L.A. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, thanks for having me on your show, and hopefully I can... Uh, you know, shed some light on some of this stuff that people have been, um, unbeknownst to me, talking about um, for a very long time now. And I guess in recent years, it's gained more interest and more traction. So, um, yeah, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, I'll, you know, answer whatever I can, just based on whatever I know. Okay. Well, let me let me just start at the beginning. Where where's the co the connection here between your family, you, your family? and the so-called Kandahar Giant. How does all this connect? Um, well, I guess you could say it connects um, with my father and his uh, childhood and upbringing with my grandmother, who, when he was young, he witnessed doing some, um, some weird things that he didn't really understand until he was a little older um, when, you know, he was kind of a wild and crazy guy in his youth. And, <laughs> You know, Aren't we all? go out and right. yeah yeah we all are and um i you know he would long story short he would go out like camping with his buddies and stuff you know in the mountains there um and there's a lot of you know i guess outdoorsy things to do there's fishing there's swimming you know and camping and just you know playing cards and stuff you know right by the uh river you know just like a lot of people and a lot of uh cultures do and um but let me answer so where is this taking place this is taking place in Kandahar, in okay. Afghanistan. Okay. Um, I just my father was clear. born in, uh, I believe it was either three thirteen thirty six or three thirteen thirty seven. I have his uh, death certificate. Oh, okay. um, I'd have to look, but it's one of those years. Um, he was about seventy seven when he died, uh, and that would have been in twenty thirteen. Now, um, at the end of March. But um, this pretty much began, I guess, with him when he was just hanging out with his buddies in the mountains and. Um, he said when he was by himself one time, he saw something that was really, really strange and it piqued his interest. So he asked his mother about it and she told him that, you know, there was something that lives in those caves and he's 
smart to stay out of those caves. She basically told him, you know, if you want to find out what that thing is, you know, you're, you're probably going to regret it. So I advise you stay out. And then after that, um, he connected two and two and, uh, he's like, Oh, okay. I guess, you know, every time we go up near this cave and leave this animal, perhaps that's what we're doing. And that's indeed what they were doing. So now when you say leave the animal and I, I know something here and I'm going to, I'll, I'll let you tell your story and then I'll tell you what I know. Uh, I okay. think I think it's going to be interesting. When you say leave the animal, uh, elaborate on that. What are you talking about? Well, um, my family owned animals over there. Uh, they raised for food and periodically they would go to a certain location and my father would witness my uh, his mother lead an animal up to this area where there was a cave, you know, like within a stone's throw away, um, very, very close to where they would tie this animal up. And um, that's pretty much what he told me he uh, he saw when he was very young. And then when he was older and he had seen this big giant footprint um, after it rained one day. And then when he questioned his mother about it, that's when, you know, he kind of made the connections uh, that perhaps, you know, that's why they were leaving animals there when he was much younger. And, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's really wild, um, stuff, but you know, I, I can only go based on what my father told me. And he told me that he was a little bit freaked out when she told him that. So he dug a little more and asked her about it. And she pretty much said that it, it's a gin. It's this, uh, I don't know if you would call it a demon or, okay. um, just another being that lives in the earth. But apparently there was a bunch of these things and there were people for generations going and leaving these, um, I guess you would call them offerings, um, peace offerings, or just like, uh, you know, like World War One Neville the Appeaser, <laughs> you know, something like that. <laughs> right. Um, I don't know if there was like this, uh, this trust that had formed between certain <sighs> bloodlines and families throughout, you know, time, but um that that's that's what I came to know from my father. It's interesting you should say that because I've heard that exact story from another source saying that mm. that they would bring uh, goats or animals and tie the animal up near the cave, and of course that yeah. would that would appease the giant or, or the giants yeah. plural that were there. Yeah. Um, did did your father ever say anything um, about how <clears throat> big it was? Had he ever seen it? Or did his uh, did his mother ever say how big it was, or had she seen it? I I I don't believe so. Um, my father never told me he saw anything. He just told me he saw a gigantic footprint, and he didn't specify like how many digits it had, like if it had six toes or five toes. Right. I I didn't actually know about the six toe thing until much later. much much later okay. um, after he died, and I saw another video on it. Um, and I did a little more digging and I uh, saw something about uh, the Jaredites. I guess there were these people that came to America and they fit the description of these tall red headed, uh, red headed giants. And um, that's uh, I guess that's open for discussion. A lot of people are very skeptical of this whole subject matter. So, well, no, I, I understand that. But, you know, part of my wheelhouse is being on the trail of the Nephilim, which is the name of the show. And and right. I know that um, the giants did exist. I mean, I've I have a picture of a giant skeleton that was that I discovered in the Catalina Island Museum, and I was probably awesome. never supposed to see that. But but at any rate, there was a cache mm -hmm. of records that had gone missing for like forty or fifty years, and it was the Ralph Glidden collection. And there was a trunk that they found. John Borgina actually found it uh, in the. Wrigley Theater on the island of Catalina in the attic <clears throat> in the middle of nowhere. So this made the front page of the LA Times. And one thing led to another. I was able to go out. So by the time I get to the museum, which is months later, everything's sorted. Everything is cataloged, put in manila envelopes, folders, museum boxes tucked away in a vault. It's not like a, a cat. It's not like opening a trunk and going, oh my gosh, what's this? It had already been sorted right. through. So I got there after the museum had closed. There were two tables 
<clears throat> with white paper on them. I had museum gloves. My camera was set up. John Borgina asked me, what do you want to see? I said, bring out the pictures. So he brings out several boxes, museum boxes, of pictures. And I start sorting mm -hmm. through them. Now, I've been in archives before, and most of the time you never find anything. But this was pay dirt immediately. And I found a picture of Ralph Gooden leaning on a shovel. And in front of him is a dis is an art, uh, a skeleton in situ. It's not disarticulated. It's not a bone pile. The skeleton is there. The skull is huge. And, and that, that skeleton, I actually uh, sent that picture, um, the, my picture of the picture, okay? So it's original stuff. I sent it to three yeah. different researchers. <clears throat> Excuse me. All of them put that at just, just around nine feet tall. So we know that they, and, and Native Americans have the same oral tradition, same legend of red hair giants, six fingers coming over to the Americas. So in the biblical narrative, it's, and, and this is what's interesting. It talks about Joshua and Caleb going into the promised land and the Nephilim tribes are there. So we think that there's a diaspora as, as, they, as Joshua and Caleb press the conquest, these guys just leave. So Afghanistan is not that far away from the modern nation of, let's say, Syria or Israel or, or Iraq. I mean, it just isn't. Um, it's, yeah. you know, and if, if you see part of this thing is you just said something that this has been going on for generations. And, and I've often stated that when the soldiers shot the Kandahar giant, um, this thing, the stench was unbelievable. It, the, just the, the, the thing was about 12 to 14 feet tall, but the smell from the body was just unbelievable. And so you ask yourself, how old is this thing? Is it a thousand years old? Is it two thousand years old? So that's what I know. And you know, it's like the Mormons call them the Jaredites. So we're talking, I think, the same thing, maybe just different interpretations. So what when you yeah. hear that, what do you think? I mean, I wasn't there, <laughs> but um I think uh any anything's possible. Um and my father said that the footprint he saw was almost as long as he was tall. He said it was very big. He almost could have like laid down in it. Um, how how old was your dad when he saw this? He was a teenager. Wow. Yeah, he was he was a teenager when he saw this, um, and it, it really uh, shook him. It, it really <laughs> it really I'm freaked sure him out. Um, in fact, he he was so scared that after that he didn't go camping too much anymore. And his friends kind of like, you know, made fun of him. And for the rest of his life, my dad said that he was very, very careful as to like who he told about that. Um, just because it got him a lot of ridicule when he tried to talk about it with someone and he was scared of his mother. So I, I guess he was told to keep it quiet as well. Um, Tell me more about his mother. I mean, what your grandmother, what was she involved in? That I'm not exactly sure, but my dad said that she would uh, she would consort with spirits and she would basically like have these jinns, these like uh, creatures sweep her floors for her. You know, um, my father said that he can recall times when the broom was just levitating off the ground and it was, you know, I mean, that's very uh, cliche, I told him, you know, because witches are supposed to ride brooms and stuff. But he said, sure enough, she uh, she had all of these things in motion without even being present in the room. Um, so I imagine what she did was she used it for either nefarious purposes or to. I don't know, I, I guess you could say just make life easier, just, you know, it's kind of like a Faustian thing right. where maybe she knew that later she's going to have to pay a price for it. Her um, soul. And that's why she had that tattoo on her forehead uh, was, you know, it was, I guess, an attempt to um, mitigate any type of consequences in this life. Um, yeah. What, what was <laughs> but, the tattoo? Uh, do you know? I mean, did you do you have a picture of it or can you draw it? What, what did the tattoo show? It was Arabic writing. OK. Um, I once saw a picture of my grandmother holding me in her arms uh, when I was just an infant. And I don't know whatever happened to that photo. Um, I think my uncle has it, and he's back in um, Pakistan, I believe, in Karachi. And he has been there since, I believe, 
the last pandemic uh, started, he had to go back. Um, he had a stroke or a heart attack or something when he was living with my sister in New Jersey. Um, so he has all of these really interesting photos and I, I believe he's the one that has one of those, but that's probably in the old country. So, wow. Wow. Have yeah. you gone but back? I did see that before. Have you gone back yeah. to Kandahar at all? I've never gone back to Kandahar. Okay. No, um, nine 11 happened. I believe it was the third or fourth day of my ninth grade year. When I was in high school, uh, I was going to William Tennant High School in Warminster, Pennsylvania at the time. And that's that that's pretty much when I decided they might think, I don't know, my uncle told me to never go there. They might think I'm a spy, <laughs> you know, okay. straight up. Um, plus, it doesn't help that uh, my uncle in foster care was in the CIA. So I don't know who would see that. Uh, but, you know, people have their ways of doing uh, research on you. And he told me it would be a good idea for you to never go to Afghanistan. You know, it doesn't matter if you know me or our family, you will probably get kidnapped and ransomed. Wow. wow. <laughs> and you may have to extract yourself. Yeah. So he wow. warned me about it. Wow. And I don't speak the language. I did when I was a child. And then I went in foster care and my parents' parental rights were terminated. So that would have been in, I believe, 98. I stopped visitations with them. I went into foster care in 95. And uh, I, I was told by my uncle, even when I was an adult, to stay the heck out of there. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't end well. I don't know how it would be now, but while the Americans were there, he said it wasn't a good idea. It makes sense. Wow. Yeah. Why, can I ask you a personal question? Why did you, how, how did you wind up in foster care? Um, well, my father, came here when I was about 10 months old. It was me, it was my sister immediately older than me. And then it was also my mother, her brother, who's my uncle, who I told you might have the photo of my grandmother. And um, it was my two oldest sisters as well. So it was the four kids, the parents and my uncle. And I'm not sure why they wanted to move here, but I'm assuming it was because uh, the Russians were invading and uh, my sister's three years older than me, and she was born in Pakistan. So they must have came here. My sister was born in like, I think, 83 or 84. I believe 84, like late 84. Um, and they uh, left Afghanistan when I believe a couple of my uncles died okay. uh, fighting the Russians. Mm. And then huh. my mother had family in Karachi. And we went there, and from there we came to America. I see. So um, from Kandahar yeah. to Pakistan to America. Okay, I, I get that. Yeah. I understand Yeah, that. and there were stories about my father, how he got all of us into the country. And uh, apparently he'd be gone for months and months at a time. And I don't know if he was working, you know, clandestinely for, you know, the U.S. government. I mm -hmm. mean, we have always speculated that he did, and that's how we got here. And then it was a little weird, the circumstances in which, you know, I was put in foster care. And then next thing you know, I have uh, an uncle who was in the CIA, you know, who lived there. And this happened right before 9-11 happened. And mm. uh, this guy was extremely, um, this guy was extremely uh, scary, my uncle. Uh, very, very cool guy. Um, his name was John. Um and I, I miss the hell out of that guy. <laughs> he was awesome. Wow. But um, yeah, yeah. I, I we always had the feeling my dad maybe worked with U.S. intelligence or something, and mm -hmm. that's how we were able to come here. And um, it could all be a farce. I mean, for all I know, Don't he know. just smuggled heroin over there yeah. because he did that as well. Right. Okay. So, yeah. Wow. Let me ask you something. Um, do, with your grandmother, did you ever meet your grandmother, your father's mother, the one? The one who was a, for all practical purposes, a witch who would bring animals to the giant's cave. Yeah, apparently she held me in her arms and that's, you know, that's who was in the photo with me as an okay. infant. Okay, but um, you later on is, in life... Is my was, father's mother. No connection. Is the witch. And no, I, like, she, I guess she died after we moved to America. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Did your dad ever... Um, point out to you where the cave's location was no he just said it was it, it was it was near his village someplace and he said it was a little bit like off the beaten path you know you had to kind of know where it was um 
but apparently a lot of people knew, well, a lot of people who dabbled in those dark arts knew like about it. Um, other people, it's like there were rumors and I guess conspiracy theories right. <laughs> about right. a, a giant living in a cave near the village. Um, but you know, I, I guess you really had to be in the know. Very interesting. But he said it was near the village. Wow. Well, uh, I just I just want to thank you so much for you know coming on the record. Um, it's it's an amazing story, and what what sort of um, you know your testimony is just yet another witness which validates what we broke in our in our Watchers series. That's Watchers Ten with the Kandahar mm -hmm. Giant, and um, I was actually threatened by a guy from a deep state. Um, literally, at, I might at, be next. I, I've thought about it. I've been warned about it. Um, I had a couple friends um, who saw the Terry Carter interview tell me, you know, people be might careful. come after you for this. And I'm like, well, people have been coming after me my whole life. I have a bullet in my neck. I mean, <laughs> what, do you, what do you want me to say? You know, I'm not I'm not scared to die. I'm not suicidal. Let's right. throw that out there. Right. But I'm not scared to die. So well, what, what's interesting is is um, uh, the shooters were, were dispatched. In other words, one patrol. The story, as as we were told from from the shooter, um, there was a patrol in Afghanistan in Kandahar looking for high value targets, and mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. were dispatched. They missed their rally point. They missed their second rally point. Next morning, uh, a helicopter drops them off in the same location, and they're following a trail. Um, and we show all this in the Watchers, in, in our Watchers, it's in Watchers 10. And um, they they come around this area, it's a very mountainous area, and they come around this like trail and they see bones and, and just, it's like this really weird deal. And they're high up and below them is the valley and the cave is above them. And as they're walking on this like ledge that overlooks the valley, that's when the mm -hmm. giant comes out. Six fingers, red hair. He's brandishing a very large spear. He moves with such agility that um, it stuns the group. It stuns the platoon. They're frozen in their tracks. Who wouldn't be? They're seeing something yeah. that's 14 yeah. feet tall. I mean, that's a really big yeah. guy. And yeah. before anybody can do anything, the giant has run and speared one of the guys and held him up. And then somebody yells, shoot him in the head, shoot him in the head. And they, they just open fire. They essentially decapitate him. And then what happens is uh, this guy who is impaled, he dies, unfortunately, never makes it out of there. And they, they chopper, a, a big, huge Huey comes in. They net the, the giant up. They take the body back. And... They're all debriefed and told never to say anything about it again. Where have we heard that before? I've had other people come up to me at conferences and talk about talk about this. Um, other witnesses, and that's all I'll say. I believe it's true. I believe that you know your story just adds another layer of credibility to what we're looking at. Um, and is in my opinion, it's very possible that these that the giants from 3,000 years ago, literally, left the area and migrated into Kandahar and basically set up shop there. Because, you know, one thing that you said, it goes back generations. So, you know, it's, it's interesting that you know that and stated that. Thanks for coming on the record, Ray. I'll, I'll give you the last word, and I really appreciate it. Well, I, I do know something else that um, I spoke to my father about that I didn't mention in Terry's interview. And that was that there are these creatures in the earth called Mabazume. Um, I spoke to Terry about this, but I, I didn't say it in the interview um, with him. Um, essentially, they call them like, uh, I guess, a word for monster, but they're like these acid lickers. And I'm not sure if it's in the Quran or in the Hadith, but apparently they live in the earth and they're licking the side of the mountain and their tongues are like acid. And at the end of every day, they get tired and they say, okay, we're going to stop. And if they don't say we're going to stop, inshallah, then otherwise the mountain grows back. But if the day that they say, 
we're going to stop and start tomorrow, inshallah. In God's name. The mountain's not going to grow back and they're going to break out of the earth. And my dad said that in the end of days, there are going to be these creatures, um, Mabizume, that come to the surface and attack people. And I don't know if it's these giants. I don't know if it's other things as well. But I thought that was another tidbit that uh, should maybe be shared because my grandmother is over here telling my dad that they're jinns. And then, you know, she's doing the black magic. She's leaving animals up there. And here the Quran or the Hadith. Um, I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm not a Muslim. But um, I know that my dad said in one of those books, there's a tale of these creatures that live in the earth. And, you know, God's supposed to release them uh, you know, in the end of days. And what's interesting about that, that ties into, in my opinion, where there's actually scripture that talks about, um, you know, in the day, it'll be like the days of Noah when Jesus returns. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what Jesus right, tells right. us himself. It'll be like the days of Noah when, when I return. And that begs the question, what differentiates those days? The giants were here. The giants were, yeah. were roaming the earth. So I find it very interesting, the correlation um, you know, in in the Hadith or in the Quran um, that yeah. talks about the same thing. I find that very, very interesting. But Ray, thanks so much for coming on the record. I really appreciate it. And um, please stay in touch. And, and thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. And, you know, if there's anything else that I can help with or answer, you know, just based on my very, I guess, limited secondhand knowledge, you know, I'd love to. Thank you so much. Folks, there you have it. If you're interested in watching the entire film, it is in Watchers 10, where we interview the shooter who was uh, in the armed forces and at the, uh, in Kandahar, the Kandahar province. There's also a second witness uh, that we've interviewed. Uh, and this is old stuff. This is um, 2015, 2014, when we released that film. So here it is, it's mm. almost 10 years later. And, and now we're hearing yet another story which collaborates what um, corroborates, I should say, what uh, the shooter and what we covered in our Watchers series. Anyway, folks, there is a hidden history that's been deliberately obfuscated from the peoples of the world, and that's why we are on the trail of the Nephilim.